Good afternoon, everybody. Buon pomeriggio, or good evening, good morning uh, from wherever you're joining us uh, from. My name is Teresa Fiore. I uh, am the Inzera Chair in Italian and Italian American Studies at Moncler State University. Um, a position that is linked to the Italian program uh, housed in the Department of World Languages and, uh, um, and Cultures. Um, as uh, uh, this uh, uh, slide uh, shows you uh, over the, uh, the years, uh, uh, I have had uh, the uh, opportunity uh, to uh, organize uh, um, several events uh, in, uh, uh, in my position, um, uh, events uh, that uh, uh, have been uh, made possible uh, by the support of uh, uh, Mr. Insera and uh, uh, his family, uh, thanks uh, uh, to um, uh, his uh, uh, support, uh, we are able to offer cultural programs uh, uh, such as this one uh, tonight, uh, to which uh, I welcome uh, uh, you all. Um, these uh, uh, events uh, uh, are um, by nature uh, transnational, by which I mean that we're interested uh, uh, in looking at Italy and its language and its culture uh, from a, a particular perspective uh, that is uh, um, in tune with the present, but really reflects the nature of culture over the centuries. We look at, at uh, what uh, is in Italy that comes from outside and how Italy exists uh, outside uh, of itself. It means that we look at uh, human mobility in terms of migrations, in terms of colonialism, we're interested in the circulation of objects, of people, uh, of ideas. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, clearly what we're doing tonight uh, is uh, um, a reflection of, uh, uh, of, that, of that moment, uh, of that spirit. Um, our um, uh, events are also uh, collaborative. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the genesis of uh, tonight's uh, event, Santiago Italia stories of refugees of the past in today's world of tightening uh, borders, um, um, which is really the result of a class that I've had the pleasure of teaching for a couple of years called Italian for Spanish Speakers, a class that reflects a, a pretty recent designation, federal designation for our campus. Uh, we are a Hispanic serving institution, which means that uh, a large portion of our student body and a growing one of that, roughly 30%, uh, is actually of uh, Latin American origin. And uh, when uh, I started teaching this class, I also thought that uh, the uh, um, fascinating galaxy of connections between Italy and Latin America and Spain really deserved a, a much better space in terms also of cultural programs. And I started thinking about a series that would be devoted to this specific topic. And uh, um, I was thinking about what could actually launch this series. And when uh, uh, roughly a year ago, I was uh, uh, sitting at the Lincoln Center watching uh, Santiago Italia, I knew that that was uh, uh, the way to start this series. Uh, the series is called the Dentro Afuera, a play on word between uh, Italian and Spanish. Uh, and uh, uh, Santiago Italia with its uh, story of uh, uh, friendship, uh, human and political, uh, was definitely uh, the best way uh, to open uh, uh, this, uh, this space of dialogue uh, across continents, across countries. Of course, uh, it became absolutely natural and organic to involve the uh, uh, Hispanic Serving Initiatives Office on campus. Uh, and I have the pleasure of now presenting uh, Dr. Katia Paz Golf Farm, who is uh, uh, the director of this uh, office uh, and assistant uh, uh, vice president, and also somebody originally from Chile, uh, out of coincidence. Katia. Gracias, uh, uh, Teresa. Um, Thank you, Teresa. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, it is really an honor to be here. Estimados invitados, 
colegas, estudiantes y todas las yes, personas que están con nosotros hoy, que por el número son today. muchos. I see um, the number, there's a lot of you. It's an honor because um, it really shows what it is possible in our university. And for me, it is very important to put a spotlight on Dr. Fiore because she uh, embraced our uh, designation as Hispanic serving institution and took us to the next level. Uh, she offers all the time collaborative uh, we brainstorm together, we talk about what we can do together, and the offering of opportunities, events, classes that actually strengthen our similarities instead of always, you know, putting the emphasis on what makes us different. Uh, in this sense is what it makes us so uh, similar. Uh, in culture, in language. Uh, I was listening to Italian. I, I do not know Italian, but I can make it. I can make <laughs> some of the things that are going on. Why? Because it, again, what it makes us part of it, what it makes us together in this world. And I think that that's um, for our institution that uh, has grown, it is a wonderful space and it is a wonderful uh, colleague to have in the university, always, always. On another hand, uh, the conversation today and this event is very personal. I left uh, Chile with my parents and my brothers uh, a couple of months before El Golpe. Uh, I was nine years old, I remember. Um, I remember the separation from my grandparents. Uh, that piece still is with me. Uh, the sense of immigration, what uh, Dr. Fiori was talking about, the movement, the adentro, the afuera, the coming together, it is all part of it. Um, so it has been very, um, I, it had been a very long time since I have seen, for example, Allende's picture. Um, so when I saw the documentary also, uh, La Moneda, um, the feelings uh, of uh, being a, an immigrant, the feeling of movement, the feeling of having to leave what you felt was secure to you and embrace a life uh, outside and be where I am uh, today with my family. So I thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for doing the work that is going to be presented today. And, uh, Hablamos dentro de un rato. Gracias, Katia. We're going to talk in a Gracias. little bit. Um, uh, speaking of collaborations, uh, uh, I want to now uh, turn to uh, um, uh, the partnership that this uh, um, uh, series actually also inaugurates, uh, um, the one with uh, the prestigious uh, Academy of Italian uh, Cinema, uh, David, uh, the Donatello uh, Awards. Uh, um, it's uh, uh, an extreme uh, privilege for us. Uh, and uh, um, we have devoted uh, uh, much space to Italian uh, cinema over the years uh, through the Insera Endowment. Uh, uh, but clearly this type of uh, uh, partnership uh, um, uh, takes it to uh, another level. And uh, I am uh, very honored to have uh, uh, the president and artistic director with us, uh, Piera de Tassis, and uh, uh, Massimo uh, Mascolo, advisor to the president for awards innovation and uh, uh, reform, whom uh, I wanna thank at a very um, um, personal and not just professional level. Uh, I've known Massimo for many years. We've already collaborated in different forms, uh, but this is really the first time uh, that we are focusing so specifically on a partnership. Uh, and it's been uh, uh, a true pleasure, uh, thanks to his professionalism, kindness, and generosity. Uh, and uh, um, I, um, I would like now to leave uh, the virtual floor to him to say a few words and then introduce uh, Piera de Tassis. Grazie, Massimo. Gracias, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa and Montclair State University and Terra Chair for this uh, opportunity that, uh, to present and discuss uh, Santiago Italia, a great documentary by Nanni Moretti. And uh, thank you for uh, this partnership that uh, 
really is uh, it marks the first also for the David Di Donatello Award because the David Di Donatello video platform uh, is uh, designed to support the, the work of the juries, the documentary committee, the short film jury, and the main jury, more than 1,600 uh, filmmakers that uh, watch movies and vote uh, every year for the best in Italian cinema. But for the first time this week, we open the platform to an international audience, to you, to present Santiago Italia and to be part of the, today's uh, program. Uh, uh, we are looking forward to, to do more and more uh, of these uh, kind of projects. And it's important, uh, as Katia has uh, said, uh, uh, to come together and, as uh, you said, to find the ways to share movies it is very important also for the italian academy uh, we are limited right now uh, in the ways we can experience movies movies together but uh, this is an opportunity and uh, so i'm i'm very happy that we are doing that and this is part also of a, a broad effort to innovate and reform the italian academy that started uh, back in 2018 uh, with the, the new president and artistic director of the, the Academy, uh, Piera De Tassis. She's here with us uh, today, tonight, uh, depending on the time zone. And uh, uh, I, I will introduce uh, her in, uh, in a second, but uh, just a few words. She is uh, a journalist, she is a critic, uh, a film festival creator, organizer. Uh, she uh, directed the, the most important uh, uh, film magazine in Italy, Chuck Magazine, for more than 20 years. She's now editor at large for cinema and entertainment uh, at the Earth Publication. Uh, of course, she's uh, the president of uh, the Davide Donatello Film Awards. And really, one thing I want to stress is that first, she's the, she's the first female president in the history of the Davide Donatello Film Awards, but really she is, she has been, and she is a catalyst for the industry, in the, of the industry, of the Italian film industry. Always uh, uh, accomplishing so much in terms of bringing together all the voices, all the professionals working in the Italian film industry. And that is very important for an academy, but in general, and I think that now more than ever, it's important to find common ground, to build bridges, and she's always bridging, uh, building uh, uh, connections also between filmmakers and the audience. And that's something that I think is very important. But without further ado, uh, Piera is here with us. Piera De Tassis, buonasera, benvenuta, grazie di essere qui con noi. Good evening, ah, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Grazie, Sorry, grazie di queste Thank you. meravigliose parole. Thank you for um, this wonderful words. Fare... It's too troppe, much. Troppe cose. It's as if che I was doing cose. too grazie much. I had to understand. Grazie thank Teresa, you, grazie everybody. Thank you, Teresa. Moncler, thank State you, Moncler State University. State University. Grazie soprattutto a Massimo Mascolo. And thank you perché senza Massimo Mascolo, tutto quello che Massimo Mascolo, io non avrei potuto farlo. Quindi, stiamo lavorando moltissimo. Io stiamo lavorando moltissimo. Io sono molto, molto onorata di partecipare e molto felice di partecipare a questo incontro, di introdurre il Davide di Donatello uh, e Davide la collaborazione con il Davide di Donatello. Come ha detto Massimo, è la prima volta che the la nostra piattaforma si apre a all'estero, diciamo che supera i confini markets, e questa è una grandissima opportunità, soprattutto in questo momento, naturalmente per noi, ma per tutti, in Italia oggi, in Italy, in Italy, i cinema sono chiusi di nuovo, e abbiamo fatto l'edizione di quest'anno della serata dei Davide, per la prima volta nella storia, sempre in televisione, per la prima serata, ma senza pubblico, e tutti collegati così, tutti gli artisti, gli attori, Connecting from home, all the artists, all the talent, filmmakers uh, connected remotely from home, like we're doing now. It was deeply moving because uh, um, all the workers in the film industry who are going such a, through such a hard time were together. I am very happy because I have been connected to Nanni Moretti for many years. Nanni Moretti, who is the 
director of the film Santiago è uno Italia. dei più importanti artisti e intellettuali he is one of the italiani. most important Italian Italiani artists dal, and intellectuals starting from the 70s he started talking about Italy I tried to be brief ma but it's hard to do with more of this work he described Uh, Italy just changing the face of Italian comedy. Ironia, he um, was able to describe Italy with irony, uh, with a manche, great sense of humor, certa, but at the same time in a very con, raw una way, firma with a very uh, firm stance. Uh, I've been very committed politically. Volte he was nominated 44 times eh, for the Donatello Award, and uh, he Davide won Donatelli three times and, uh, for his best Italia, film and nine times overall. With Santiago Italia, he won in 2019, uh, the last fare, edition that in, we were able to diciamo, hold um, in person. Ha vinto, uh, At that time, he won the prize for um, the best documentary. It was the year of our reform. That is the year in which, for the first time, we had a committee that was specific to selecting i film uh, documentari so da mettere poi in piattaforma per il voto finale. Quindi è stato molto, on the platform for a final vote. molto importante. Therefore it was very important. Molto importante perché è stato uno dei tanti cambiamenti che abbiamo fatto. It was one of the changes uh, that we implemented. Naturalmente stiamo lavorando moltissimo Naturally, così we're webinar, working uh, a lot uh, this way with webinars, uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom uh, on the website, on social, social media. Da mesi abbiamo so we've been working this way for months. We work a dirlo non siamo All year round, we are not just an award ceremony Anche just one evening, which is a beautiful serata, moment, but it's not just that. We work in the film industry um, all year long and we do training. Da cui siamo One of per the la points e a cui tengo that we started from for our reform, il, which is very dear to my heart, is creating gender balance. Di We tried to create more balance in terms of the members of the jury um, right eh, away between the number of men and women in the jury. And thanks to Massimo, anche we also una started a uh, series streaming. Um, streaming series. Maestre, proprio the per title of it is Maestro, Maestre, uh, so feminine, uh, it's about women who cioè, are uh, behind the camera. La Among prima these women, there is the first Italian cinematographer who was part of the jury as Daria a nominee. Antonio. Her so name is Daria D'Antonio. Uh, di similitudine, This is something that we have in common because today here we have the cinematographer for Nanni Moretti's film. Uh, Morales Bergman um, e quindi Ms. Morales Bergman è, è per me ancora più, più importante all the more important fare il punto non solo su quello che il film that, il documentario racconta need to focus not only on what the film talks about and on the connections between um, the story of Chile in the documentary and Italian history and all the movements that were underway at that time but it is also important that there is a woman right by Nani Moretti, uh, who is a director, as you say in Spanish, a woman director of um, cinematography, uh, of photography. Um, this is one of the most important points that is creating gender balance and uh, diversity for our award. So thank you so much. I'm not going to uh, dwell upon this any further. I just wanted to thank you for including all these languages. Very well, English, but it's not the case. So, so <laughs> I, I, I choose to speak Italian because I, 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 I want to explain myself in a better okay. way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie, grazie infinite. Thank you. We knew that it grazie was an honor, and now we know uh, even more so. Uh, given the, uh, the instruments that you have uh, made available to us, uh, your uh, overall objectives uh, certainly in tune with, uh, uh, with others, uh, and uh, um, certainly this is a beginning. Um, so uh, let me now uh, move on with uh, um, uh, some other information about the, uh, the meeting today. We've talked about Italian cinema, Uh, um, I said that uh, um, the entire events are by definition transdisciplinary. This is certainly the case once more. 
We're going to be talking about Chilean history um, and Italian history as a result, in particular political history, uh, and so international and national politics and diplomacy. It was then absolutely uh, uh, predictable that we would collaborate with the Department of Political Science and Law at Montclair State University. My special thanks go to uh, uh, the chair, Tony Spanakos, uh, but in particular to Alfredo Toro Carnevali, uh, um, a dear colleague um, uh, whom I always look up to because he has one of the most established series of talks on campus. Uh, uh, he uh, brings uh, uh, UN diplomats in particular, but uh, certainly uh, he has a uh, uh, place to the spotlight on the importance of international relations uh, uh, for our students and the community, uh, the community at large. I will uh, call on Alfredo uh, a little bit uh, uh, later. And uh, um, um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to give you uh, some more information uh, about the, uh, the event. Uh, we are going to have a, a presentation by one of our main speakers. Uh, in a moment, Alfredo will uh, introduce him. Um, and then uh, we will have uh, um, a back and forth between me and uh, uh, Maura Morales uh, uh, Bergman, uh, the director of uh, uh, the photography of Santiago Italia. Um, and, uh, um, and then uh, we will uh, uh, reconvene the three of us uh, to watch uh, some clips uh, from, uh, uh, from the film. And uh, we will conclude the time permitting with some questions uh, from our audience. Uh, this is a plurilingual event, you've already discovered. Uh, apologies for not mentioning this uh, uh, before, uh, but I think many of you have figured out that we have uh, an interpretation tool available because even though the main language is English, we're going to have portions uh, in Italian as well as uh, in, uh, in Spanish. So please click the globe on the bottom menu uh, that says interpretation. Uh, um, the interpretation goes exclusively towards English as the target language uh, and not vice versa. Special thanks here to uh, Lilia Pino Bluen, uh, not just for interpreting, but for being uh, such a lover of, uh, of film and a pleasure to work with. This is uh, uh, an event with uh, uh, multiple geography. We have speakers connected from Italy, from the US, obviously from Chile and even Guatemala. Uh, and uh, um, uh, all of this is made possible behind the scenes uh, by Lydia Rosenberg, uh, who provides her expertise uh, uh, on uh, Zoom and much uh, uh, intellectual vibrancy along uh, with, uh, uh, with it. Um, uh, let's now then uh, uh, turn uh, to uh, um, uh, a bit of information about Moretti, although Piera already did the job, so thank you, Piera. Uh, uh, you've been introduced uh, to, uh, uh, to this uh, pillar of uh, uh, Italian uh, cinema. Um, um, I would add probably that uh, we're dealing with a character, uh, uh, an actor, uh, a writer, a director, who's been for long a bit misunderstood in the United States. Uh, a 1994 article by the New York Times uh, uh, was titled, Will Americans Ever Appreciate Nanni Moretti? Now, 16 years afterwards, of course, uh, we can say yes, uh, in part because uh, uh, his production has become uh, much more diverse. Uh, it has embraced uh, 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 many more subjects, uh, many more, more sensibilities. Uh, and uh, uh, you see here some of the movies that really have uh, become much uh, more uh, recognizable within the American, uh, 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 with the American audience, Caro Diario, Mia Madre, we have a Pope, the Sun's uh, uh, Room. But uh, with Santiago Italia, what I think is really interesting, uh, as it shows in the next, uh, um, in the next slide, um, we have the documentarist. Uh, and uh, uh, um, Nanni Moretti is, is not traditionally a documentarist. It's really somebody who has crafted a very uh, unique uh, cinema, blending uh, different, uh, different genres. And, uh, um, and certainly this time, uh, once again, uh, he has shown uh, is uh, intellectual curiosity, is uh, ability to, uh, uh, to search for uh, new uh, forms of, uh, uh, of expression and, and for new topics altogether, as Maura will tell us uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in a little while. Uh, the movie is, uh, um, um, is dramatic, but it's also uh, comic. Um, uh, it is uh, um, 
uh, it brings together a chorus uh, of, uh, of voices. Uh, we see uh, uh, his ability to embrace uh, the most uh, uh, diverse people, from workers uh, to uh, to diplomats, uh, and, uh, um, and 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 really, what he's testing is the ability of history to uh, uh, allow us to read the present, uh, the legacy of this moment in time, which has been um, uh, was vastly forgotten before he made Santiago Italia has come to the surface, has come to the surface again uh, with, a, with a very important story, which uh, in a way explains to you the reason why our event today is uh, 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 called as it is called, uh, in the sense that there is a, a link to today's uh, stories of refugees, right, uh, to uh, uh, contemporary experiences. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, at least in my view, one of the most powerful aspects of, uh, uh, of the documentary. Um, now, as this uh, uh, um, um, documentary allows us uh, to uh, uh, connect uh, um, Italy uh, 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 with its own past uh, and, uh, uh, and with Chile and uh, with some of our academic objectives on campus, uh, uh, somewhat uh, unpredictably, uh, the, uh, the film and such as the event uh, uh, have become incredibly connected to uh, today's uh, reality in, uh, uh, in Chile. Uh, Chile has made uh, the headlines uh, uh, for reasons that are, in a way, uh, related uh, uh, to what Moretti has brought our attention to. And uh, I am incredibly uh, pleased to have with us Professor Jaime Baez Afrer, uh, from the Instituto de Asuntos Públicos in uh, the Universidad de Chile Santiago, uh, who will uh, precisely do this, uh, put a context uh, around uh, uh, this film. He will be introduced by my colleague Alfredo Toro Carnevali. Thank you so much, Teresa, Professor Fiori. Um, it's uh, uh, we're we're extremely grateful for the invitation to be part of this uh, terrific event. And uh, I thank you for your kind words. I'm only following your lead. It is, it is an absolute honor for me to introduce Professor Baez Afrir Jaime. He's an assistant professor of political science at the Universidad de Chile. He has a PhD from Essex University and a Master of Arts from Georgetown University in Latin American Studies. That is precisely where we met about 20 years ago. So um, I'm, I'm so happy to have him here with us today. Um, his publications focus on a variety of issues related to historical and contemporary Chilean politics, ranging from elections to party formation, security, and alliances. A research project of his looked at political reform in Chile from the first quarter of the 20th century until the Golpe of 1973. He has also published many articles about Colombian, Argentinian, and Ecuadorian politics, and he is also a journalist. Um, I could not think of anybody uh, with better credentials to talk about this uh, than uh, Jaime Baez Safrir. He will be delivering a talk on a context to understand Santiago Italia by Nani Moretti. So it gives me enormous joy uh, personally and on behalf of the Department of Political Science and Law here at Montclair State University to introduce uh, my dear friend Jaime, Professor Jaime Baeza Frier from the University of Chile. Amigo Jaime, bienvenido. Muchísimas gracias, querido Alfredo. Thanks to Teresa. I'm very humbled by your presentation. And I'm also very humbled to be surrounded by experts in cultural studies and film on aesthetics. For a political scientist, normally this is a moment where you realize sometimes how short-sighted is uh, your knowledge about the world. So I'm thrilled. I'm emotional and also I'm very grateful for the possibility of exchanging some ideas uh, about the context uh, to understand the context for appreciating better this fantastic film that I enjoyed from the beginning to the end by Nani Moretti. If you can move the slide. 
The next slide, please. Before we start, Chile is today a different country, and it would be wrong to put everybody and everything in the same bag as it was almost 50 years ago. For good or for worse, we need to assume that the nation portrayed in the first half of the documentary is no longer there. And why? Because we have 17 years of dictatorship in between, and then we have an, a never-ending transition of around 25 years from this authoritarian structure, this authoritarian framework of running the country to our current um, imperfect, our current um, with shortages, but our current democracy. And nowadays we are embarking on a, a constitutional reform that will eliminate, will tend to put an end to many of the lasting uh, authoritarian barriers that are present in our institutional framework since the end of Pinochet dictatorship by in 1990. So our current events, what's going on in Chile nowadays with a uh, big social unrest, with uh, the starting, the departing point for a constitutional reform that would finish with a new constitution by 2022, with a disarray in the party system, with the need for structural changes in, in our society, uh, is understood by its past. Not completely, but mainly because of what happened between 1970 and 1990. Let me say that Generally speaking, for Chilean society, finally, after almost three decades of the end of the dictatorship, there is an agreement about our past. There is a common understanding among Chilean society that what happened in terms of gross violations to human rights, in terms of what happened in terms of curbing the rights and the basic needs of the majority of society was wrong and that there's a need of repairing not only in terms of justice, actual justice, but also in terms of a moral reparation, an historical reparation of those who suffered the consequences and brutality of the Pinochet regime. The documentary shows several interviews, at least two, with army officers who are jailed because of their actions during that dictatorship and a former vice commander in chief of the army, an acquaintance of General Pinochet, who defended the junta and defended most of what happened in the Vera. Despite many can defend the economic reforms of, or the cultural changes during the Vera, nobody, on its right mind today would justify the gross human rights violation occurred under the watch of the junta. Those army officers interviewed are a tiny minority and they're almost forgotten by the rest of the nation. And that's very important to understand the mindset from where people in this country could watch and appreciate this documentary. The main problem the effects of the Pinochet constitution are still there. We are starting to get a read of that institutional legacy. We just started an uh, institutional itinerary that departed with the polemic side of October 25th of one month ago, almost a month ago, that said by 80% of the population, 80% of the electoral universe, that we need to get a read of Pinochet constitutions of 1980 and get a read of the institutional legacy. So we're expecting by next April to have a, con a constitutional assembly that will draft a new text and have it enforced by 2022, when a new constitution and a new start for the 21st century is expected for the nation. Of course, despite the picture I'm portraying, Chile has plenty of troubles engaging with its past. It's not only with the aftermath of the 1973 coup and the dictatorship. We have 
a basic agreement of what happened after. However, there are plenty of unresolved issues that are not only due to the Allende government between 1970 and 1973, that has been regarded as the first social experiment conducted in a representative liberal democracy, but also from issues ranging from the civil war of 1891 that put liberals against conservatives fighting not only for tax reforms, but about the social fabric and the social structure of this society, and even about the nature of the process of national organization after independence in the early 19th century. This is a complex society. Maybe we're not too many, we're only 19 million inhabitants, but with a rich history and a very complex institutional framework that departed from an early transition to independence in 19th century, way before the rest of Latin America, and with a legalistic tradition, with a con strong constitutional tradition, and also with a strong party system and a strong democratic institutionality that comes from the end of the 19th century and survived for the vast majority of the 20th century until the coup d'etat of 1973. We do have a strong sense of national identity, way more than many other countries in the region. But also, our identity has been modeled and somehow curbed by a strong social elite that controls agriculture, controls the banking system, and controls some of the social relations even up to today. They're no longer the political elites after 1990 and the end of the Pinochet dictatorship. But they still control part of the economy and they still control mass media and what is acceptable for the vast majority of society. Therefore, what this documentary presents is one of the structures, one of the breaks between the social elite and the rest of the nation, particularly between 1970 and 1973, that finished, ended up in the coup d'etat of 1973. There's no common agreement about the effects of the agenda government in the population. There's no common agreement about how it is viewed in the vast majority of the population. And Nani Moretti takes a stand in defending and supporting the government of President Allende. The figure of himself, of Allende, is highly respected by the vast majority of Chileans, no doubt of it. But the decision-making process, the policy outputs, and what happened during his administration is highly contested in several quarters of our society. We need to deal with our past but understanding that diversity, diversity in its views, diversity in how to understand Chilean history is of the essence. I will not touch that beaten part in the rest of my presentation. And the reason is because you have to respect those who are resting. The memory of President Allende, the memory of his martyrdom, and the memory of those who suffered between 1973 and 1990. The political exile, the hunger, the suffering of millions and millions makes almost irrelevant what happened before 1973 in terms if you support it or not. What happened after September the 11th, the other September 11th, 1973 onwards, it's of so much deep concern for humanity that even the dictatorship attempt attacks in Rome against the leader of the Christian Democratic Party, Bernardo Leighton, they failed, he was severely wounded, against Allende's commander in chief of the army, General Prats in Buenos Aires, they succeed, they killed General Prats, and the worst of them, in 1976, the attack and the terrorist attack against 
President Sajjan, the Minister of Foreign Relations, in the streets of Washington, D.C., Orlando Letelier, who was blown in a bomb with, with his secretary, Ronnie Moffitt, and was killed 10 blocks away from the White House. This is the criminal nature of the dictatorship that came after September 11, 1973. Next slide, please. This is La Moneda Burning, September 11, 1973, attacked by two Hawker Hunters of the Chilean Air Force. An Air Force that was supposed to protect the people of Chile, being used to attack the presidential palace. It's not only the burning of a building. It's the erasing, it's the destruction of a whole period of democratic stability that lasted for more than a century in the country. On the right hand side of this slide, you have President Arturo Alessandri reading the approved constitution of 1925, which granted a lot of stability in terms of political parties, in terms of framing an institutional mindset that was helpful for the country to overcome several social, economic, and political challenges across the 20th century. So it was not only burning in history, and was not only the burning of a building. It was also burning the fabric, the institutional fabric of a nation. So we need to explain why this was possible, and that's why you need a political scientist in this fascinating encounter we're having to understand and explain this documentary. And I will try to show you two attempts by uh, highly regarded academics, highly more regarded than this humble servant that is presenting tonight. So in order to explain why this was possible, next slide, please. One line of explanation comes from a fellow countryman and a former professor of Alfredo and myself in, uh, at Georgetown University, Arturo Valenzuela, who then became an American citizen and then the Secretary for Latin American and then Western Hemispheric Affairs of President Barack Obama. He, this is one of his most famous books, The, Democrat, the Breakdown of Democratic Regimes, The Case of Chile, 1978. For Professor Valenzuela, the breakdown of democracy was unavoidable. And the reason of this vacuum was, was the vacuum on, in the center of the political spectrum in Chile. Those who were able to balance between the extreme right and the extreme left in the political spectrum, particularly the Christian Democratic Party and the social radical, the Social Democrat Party, were unable to provide moderation because of the Cold War, because of the nature of President Allende government that was bringing a whole range of transformation and reforms in terms of agrarian reform, banking reform, educational reform. It was such the entity, was such the huge entity of these reforms that center parties, center left and certain right parties were unable to put moderation in Congress and unable to negotiate a, 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 a manifesto, a program with President Allende. And at the end of the day, the problem for Professor Valenzuela is presidentialism as a political regime, particularly in a multi-party system. And because it transformed government crisis is to, into institutional breakdowns. So to say that for Professor Valenzuela, if Chile would have attempted the 19th century uh, parliamentary regime or a semi-presidential regime, probably none of what happened after 1973 would ever surface in, and came to reality. So at the end of the day, the problem is that the Constitution of 1925 lacked elasticity 
in order to provide institutional avenues for a solution to a crisis or, uh, uh, and to a government that was dealing with such huge transformations of human society that the more conservative quarters were unable to deal and, and, and get on board. And also coming from those who were in support of President Allende, that the speed of reforms, the speed was so intense, was so rapid, so quick, that the political and the social elite, all of them were unable to process them and to integrate into the political system. And that's why in a book later, many years later, in 1994, with Professor Juan Linz of Yale University, Professor Valenzuela advocates uh, a change to parliamentary systems in, in Latin America and particularly in Chile. And this is a matter of discussion for the next Constitutional Assembly. And it's, it's arising, it's becoming one of the focal points for discussion for the new Constitutional Assembly. Next slide, please. Another line of explanation comes from the late professor uh, at the New York University, the Brazilian professor Joseph Cohen. <coughs> professor Cohen contradicts Professor Valenzuela's understanding of the crisis. And for him, the breakdown of democracy was completely avoidable. And he tried to provide an explanation that comes from rational choice and other uh, more contemporary methods based on a prisoner dilemmas in game theory. And for him, the problem uh, was the impossibility of collaboration between moderates across the political spectrum because they were involved in a prisoner dilemmas, kidnapped by the extremes, represented by the extreme right with the support of the United States and the extreme left with support of uh, the Cuban government. The Soviet Union never got very much into the, into the mix. But the big, the huge support and the big impact of what the Cuban revolution represented in many quarters of those who were supporting the government of President Allende. So for Professor Cohen, the problem was not the political regime, but extremists on both sides. And then when the military took sides in support of a coup, well, game over. The prisoner dilemma is solved. So for him, the problem was not presidentialism, but political actors involved in negotiation. So here you have two points of view that can explain the reason why behind the coup. I'm not interested in, in, in trying to say who was right, who's wrong, or if President Allende was rightly uh, in his policy or were he's wrong in his policy. But here is lines of explanation. What I can say, and I'm sure you all can agree, that the martyrdom of President Allende is a symbol for our nation and is a beacon for the rest of the continent. Next slide, please. So here you have the junta, for those who have never seen a photo of these four gentlemen. And the expression gentleman is only a saying, let me express it. At the middle, you have General Pinochet. On his side is the General of the Air Force, Gustavo Lee, who then uh, broke lines with General Pinochet and get into conflict in 1978. It was known as the subversion of the Air Force. It was a very, very tense moment between the junta that almost uh, finished in, in, a, in, in, in a civil war and month before a crisis, an, an external crisis in Argentina. So things were pretty hit up at the moment. On the left of General Pinochet, you have Admiral Marino, who for many is the mastermind of the coup and, uh, and, 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 a, and a pretty cool person after the coup. And being said this, uh, what is strange about the, the story of Admiral Merino, that he was one of the first to take the, the, the personnel of the Navy out of the government and, and back into the barracks, strangely enough. 
And on the extreme left hand side, you have the chief of the police, General Cesar Mendoza, who was involved in pretty gruesome and cruel human rights violation. The only two who remain until the end of the dictatorship are Pinochet and Merino, Army and Navy. The other two were replaced, one because he was expelled of the junta, General Lee, because he turned against the junta and then he, he, he moved into the opposition to the dictatorship. And Cesar uh, Duran, uh, the chief of the military police, Carabineros, who left the government after a uh, 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 the killing of three uh, school teachers in 1985. Next slide. So the effects of the dictatorship, uh, so to move my presentation towards the final part that regards to the relationship between Chile and Italy in political science terms that are, that are also really, really relevant. There you have on the left side on the, the upper upper left hand side of the slide you have the national stadium uh, still used today uh, for our national soccer team in its international um, games and uh, there are two memorials uh, in in commemoration of the victims that uh, perished and suffer torture and and the killing of many 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 inside the stadium on the left hand side downwards, you have the burning of books, very similar to Nazis in Germany. This is in Santiago downtown, uh, one or two weeks after the coup, uh, military personnel were called on, on site to massive burnings of uh, books regarding from uh, liberation, Catholic liberation theology to Marxism, even, art, theater, I mean, what Nazis do normally when they don't want culture around them, they burn books. And coming into terms with the movie, you have the right hand side, political exiles stepping into planes to leave the country. Many came back, many didn't. Next slide, please. So the Chilean exile, because Santiago Italia is about the Chilean exile. It was very diverse in their ideology, ranging from Christian Democrats or liberals to the extreme left, Maoist, members of the Communist Party, uh, socialists, etc. The first wave of exiles were mainly due to their uh, political membership to parties who were banned by re the regime. But there's a second wave that is less known and it's very relevant too. This is an economic wave. And it was particularly after the IMF crisis, the debt crisis of 1982, uh, when the country was left basically in shambles with huge public debt, massive unemployment, two digit un unemployment in, in, in the greater Santiago area. And uh, therefore thousands and thousands of Chileans left the country. 1982, 1983. Except for Mexico, which uh, Mexico had a huge wave of solidarity with Chile, and Venezuela, particularly with Social Democrats and Christian Democrats, most of the Chilean exile went outside Latin America, particularly some went to Canada and the United States, but most of them went to Western Europe, Canada, Australia, and to a lesser extent, some of them, including former president Michel Bachelet, went to Eastern Germany and to the Soviet Union. During the economic wave, the prime destination was Sweden. The politics, and there is a whole analysis within the literature about the politics of the exiles, the politics of exile. And it diverged in many ways. It diverged from where the exiled uh, intellectual community was writing. Those who were in Western Europe and the United States were very self-critical about President's agenda government. 
they were more reconciled with the idea of coming back to Chile very early on when the borders were reopened, 10, 12 years after the, the starting of the junta, and also were pivotal in forming the coalition that came after the dictatorship, the Concertación, who ran the country between 1990 and 2010. Those who were outside Western Europe were less prone to an understanding within opposition forces, particularly with the Christian Democratic Party. In two minutes more, I will say why this is important. And also, they were less prone to come back to the country. So those who came in the late 80s, early 90s, were able to reconnect with Chile in a faster fashion. Whereas those who came in the late 90s or the early 2000s, most of them were unable to rejoin the national community. And I would say even they, they returned back to many of the countries where they, where they settled during the, the, their, their exile. They, they, they found a Chile that was no longer in connection with the one they left at an emotional level and at, at an historical level, because they went two separate ways and, and life goes on. And that was one big problem for the Chilean exile. Next slide, please. The connection between Italy and Chile. On the left hand side, you have the most relevant ambassadors of Chilean culture in Italy during the dictatorship, Inti Gimani one of the most memorable, brilliant, well set music ensembles ever, ever, ever in Chile. They're still active, they're still playing in their 70s, and they, they are influenced in their music. They, they started with ambient music, and then they brought a huge Italian influence to their work. And nowadays, there is a mix between folkloric, Andean, Italian, and classical music in, in a wonderful mix that I'm sure all the Italians in the audience are aware of because they're, they're so well known in Italy that you have the image of the right-hand side of your screen that is from about a month and a half ago, a month ago, of uh, two of the strikers of Inter Milano, the soccer team, that are Chilean, Alexis Sanchez and Arturo Vidal. So Guarín Sportivo, that is one of the symbols, isn't it? One of the most relevant uh, sport magazines in Italy and Europe, headlined uh, before the Milano Derby against uh, Milan AC with Inter Illimani. Imagine, imagine for one second what it means, the impact of Inter, Inti Igimani as a music ensemble, as an, as an ambassador of Chilean culture during their exile in Italy. And what it means in terms of the wave of solidarity, the wave of, of, of human empathy, that Chilean exile received in Italy during those days. So I have here two prime examples about this. And, and now I'm going away from political science because this is a human level and on, on a citizen level, of a personal level, the impact of Italian culture and this mix, this exchange that was produced between our Exile community and the Italian society represented in, in TMN. They're telling me I'm over time. I have only two more slides, so let me move to the next slide. I will leave this just for the presentation. This idea that Italy and Chile, and I put it in, 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 in its original language. This idea that uh, Italy and the party system of Italy resembles a lot the Chilean one. And, 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 and because they were 
they were assembled and, and they were designed uh, more or less at the same post-war period. And, 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 and in this sense, the idea, and let, if you put the next slide so I can hurry up, when you compare the main parties in the center towards the left of the spectrum, you have in Chile the Christian Democrats, the Socialists, and the Communists. And what do you have in Italy in the 70s and the 80s? The Christian Democrats, the Socialists, and the Communists. What, what was the base of the Chilean opposition to the dictatorship? The Christian Democrats, the Socialists, and the Communists. And Italy was pivotal in supporting particularly the Christian Democrats and the Communists. And the Italian Communist Party was particularly relevant to explain to their brothers and sisters in the Chilean Communist Party that it was an, a necessity to widen up the coalition against the regime and get into talks and get into discussion and get into dialogues with the Christian Democratic Party. And this, what you see here, is the basis of some of the, of the current center-left governments we have had in Chile, actually is the basis of the party supports of the last uh, President Bachelet government between 2014 and 2018. Last slide, please. Some final thoughts. Across the documentary, you can see plenty of relevant figures of Chilean culture. And I want to finish with one. Cardinal Silva Enriquez, Archbishop of Santiago, who played a central role in providing a shelter and an advocacy for human rights and an advocacy for those who were suffering, and who moved the Catholic Church of Chile towards defending the poor defending those who were being violated in, the, in their human rights during the dictatorship. And he had a say that resembles until today. Chile has a call to understanding and not division. Chile, says Cardinal Silva Enriquez, has a vocation for a brotherhood. Let's hope that after all the suffering and all these years that had passed by, understanding is the motto for Chilean society. And then thanks to friends from all across the world, particularly the exquisite documentary that we're commenting, we can continue that path for the foreseeable future. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Jaime, for such a rich context uh, around uh, uh, the documentary. Uh, we are now um, moving immediately over to uh, Maura Morales, whom we thank her for uh, joining us for Guatemala. Uh, uh, Maura has a limited time, and so we will try to uh, get the best uh, out of her, uh, given uh, her direct contact and connection to the, uh, to the film. Uh, Massimo Mascolo uh, will uh, introduce her. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much. Very interesting, the context, the insight. And uh, for a closer look to Santiago Italia, uh, is here with us um, Maura Morales Bergman, uh, one of the most interesting filmmakers, cinematographers and filmmakers working in Italy. I'm very happy that she's here with us. Just a few words. Uh, she. Uh, grew up very much in contact uh, with uh, the audiovisual uh, professional world. I, I understand that her father is a TV director. She studied at the uh, Centro Sperimentale di Cinematografia, the National School of Cinema, on the Tuscolana near Cinecittà, very important, very iconic uh, internationally, no, not only uh, for Italian filmmakers. Uh, one of her teachers is a, a great uh, cinematographer, one of the greatest. Um, Giuseppe Rotunno, just uh, to name a few, she, he, he worked with uh, Fellini, with Visconti, the Gattopardo, the Leopard, the Rocco and his brothers, with Fellini for Satyricon, for uh, Il Casanova, Amar Cord, but uh, also worked with uh, uh, Buffossi for All the Jazz, for example. So 
she studied, Maura studied with, uh, with him uh, at the Centro Sperimentale and then went on to have a, and building a, a very interesting career uh, as a cinematographer. She, she worked, uh, of course, on Santiago Italia with uh, Nani Moretti, and I'm very excited to, to listen to what uh, she has uh, to say about uh, that, that pro this project. But uh, also with um, Oscar winners uh, like Roberto Benigni, Spike Lee, and Lina Vermuller. Um, she now has a, a documentary she directed, her directorial debut, Entierro, that is already receiving uh, awards and uh, in uh, in various places, and now is in competition at the David Donatello. That's why I have to be careful in what I'm saying because she is of course in competition and good luck uh, for that. Uh, so uh, she she just uh, arrived, I think, uh, uh, um, on the set of a new project. So she's working on a new project right now. Uh, Maura, buonasera, buon pomeriggio. Uh, good evening. Grazie, grazie Thank, you. Qui. Thank you for being uh, here with us. Parola. The Parlo in italiano, quindi? I'm going to speak o, Italian, right? Or should I continue in English? Maura, passiamo yes, all'italiano. Maura, all please, let's switch to uh, Italian. Mille. Thank you very uh, much. Con, uh, I'd like to begin storia, with your story, because you're uh, an Italian a citizen, uh, actually an origin. Ti anche di collegare questa I would also che è like to ask you to connect your human uh, uh, family experience and political experience with your role within the documentary in terms of its content and the connections you created as well. Of course. My father is Chilean, my mother is Italian. My father arrived in 1952 in Italy, so he didn't arrive um, to escape from the Pinochet coup, but a lot sooner than that, because my grandfather, who was a politician, died in 46, and my mother married an Italian after that. So this is all also the story I have in my next documentary, <laughs> which is something I want to shoot soon. E, però che, che è successo e, que, in quegli anni l'Italia era appunto years, Italy was comunista c'era una, una place where there was a communist party and there was a specific policy anni, and my father ever since he was 14 he became a member of the communist party so when the coup happened he was just like a lot of Chileans um, marked with an N on his passport, and that N meant that he couldn't go back to his country of origin. And because of that, I went back with him for the first time in 1992, thanks to those flights by non-government organizations that allowed Chileans to go back to their land, and we got to um, get to know our country together at that point. Per la famiglia, per ciò che eravamo, for our family and because of we what we were like and because of, of the education I received from my father infanzia, during my childhood and teenage years I was able to get to know Italia, all the Chileans who were in Italy um, at that time, over at that time of the coup and, and this helped, as Teresa mentioned, Italia, the film Santiago Italia because my um, connection with Nani was purely coincidental because he had come to Chile to uh, teach and thanks to the ambassador at the time uh, who knew about the story of the coup, well he described it to Nani, Nani went back to Italy very um, enthusiastic about the story which he said is one of the few beautiful things that Italy did at the time and therefore he wanted to tell the story. So thanks to his assistance he tried to gather information about who um, they could know in Chile, in the film world. And in Italy, I've become a bit of a spokesperson for co-productions between Italy and Chile. And therefore, I was invited to this wonderful lunch with um, Nani and his um, uh, first ID, in which Nani was uh, questioning me on everything. And the beautiful thing is that after a month, Nani was telling me things about Chile that I didn't know about because he studied so much after that first meeting we had. And for me, this was such a great way to learn and to get to know my second country at a deeper level. Because for me as well, 
una parte di, it was a part that was not very well known because one would know just the main facts but I didn't know it uh, in that level of detail that's not something that everybody um, does so that for me was such a beautiful moment that's how I got connected um, with Nani and Santiago Italia and then when I was part of the production I helped the production identify different people uh, that they could interview thanks to the connections that my family has and friends and friends of friends there's a lot of friends that um, ended up being interviewed in the movie of course that's inevitable at the same time this is a new kind of Nani Moretti that you met a documentary maker who actually um, takes sides, gets involved as usual, and who adapts a specific genre uh, which is highly codified, and uh, you jumped into it and you embraced this language, and you uh, looked for new solutions, therefore we just wanted to dwell a little bit upon the cinematography details that we have, um, eh, questa è una, una clip uh, this is the first clip, ehm, the che abbraccia eh, sia una, un, un regista, tra l'altro ci sono molti registi intervistati in questo documentario, è una cosa uh, mm, in this, in this molto morettiana, and this is a very uh, eh, thing però ci sono anche immagini d'archivio, quindi there forse puoi commentare uh, anche su questo discorso dell'area della testa. Prima guardiamo insieme la clip, quindi guardiamo la clip insieme era un país enamorado de Allende y de lo que estaba pasando era fantástico, era bonito, bello ¿y tú? yo estaba ahí en medio de, de la gente recuerdo que en esa época hice una película que se llamaba El primer año que es la filmación de todo lo que ocurría mes a mes durante un año El primer año de Allende era estupendo era una fiesta perpetua, en el campo, en la ciudad, en las casas. Había una alegría que yo nunca había visto en Chile. Well, intanto è stata una grande emozione per me avere due registi così dentro la stessa stanza era stata una delle interviste più emozionanti che considero Patricio Guzman il maestro perché Patricio Guzman quell'intervista è forse l'arrivo di una costruzione che è andata End point of the um, construction that went on for months. We worked between June until September, October, more or less. In June, we were back in Italy and we started with two cameras because, in the beginning, Nani wanted to um, film himself while he was uh, asking questions. So we had a camera on Tabuye uh, and a camera on him. But then, as we were getting deeper into uh, the topic, his questions would change and they would turn into um, fixed questions for each interviewee and then they would change based on the answers. And then he decided to just shoot just with one camera, not no longer two, and just focus on the interviewee and then he would do these um, central shots. You saw that Guzman is right in the middle of the shot and it would take us exactly 10 minutes to find the right central point and you know Nani didn't want to have a headroom uh, he just wanted to be very specific about the frame and since I had never worked with him before it was a work in progress for me because in the beginning I just took some material thinking I was gonna shoot with two cameras and then as we were um, working um, we changed and we started using a zoom which is something that Nani likes very much and I never thought about that so we changed lenses so as we proceeded we changed things and then we also thought about the archival footage which is very important it was 
is a lot of work which had been done um, to some extent before but also after um, it's been a greater part after we shot so um, I came in in terms of color correction in terms of um, balancing both the quality of the archival footage and the images that we shot and that we needed to um, build in. Now you added some information that I didn't have before I uh, was asked this question, but it's very interesting to know that he wanted to include himself in the film, but then he ends up disappearing behind the camera. So every now and then we do have his voice. There's a beautiful dialogue um, in which he um, suggests Italian words to the Spanish speakers who speak very good Italian, but every now and then they do need a little bit of a um, suggestion. And then there's the <laughs> deeply Moretti-like moment, which is inevitable. And that would be the moment in which he not only appears, and for those of you who don't know Nani Moretti, he is a very strong presence usually in his film, but he also comes in with a statement, a statement which is very striking. And it's very candid at the same time, and there's no compromises um, there. So let's watch it together, and then after that, I'll ask you how that came about. Pero acepté porque el señor Núñez me dijo de que esto iba a ser como quien dice imparcial, porque no solo basta de que me den den la declaración que yo hice. Pero si la ponen dentro de un contexto que, que nos perjudica, pero nos perjudica con malas palabras, por ejemplo, a continuar. Yo no soy imparcial. Yo no soy imparcial. Uno de mis momentos ha sido un momento histórico, aunque para nosotros fue un milestone moment for us as well. I just want to explain a little bit of the background. We started off with the idea of interviewing those who had been inside the embassy and who had been involved in the story. And then when we were traveling throughout Chile, and we came to Chile for 10 days, exactly on September 11th, and so it was a specific date. And then he told the Chilean producer, uh, Gabriela Sandoval, I want to interview the other side as well. I can't just work with just one side of the coin. I just want to hear the bad ones, quote unquote. So the producer did a wonderful job. We managed to have permission to enter into this uh, high security prison where nobody else had ever gone before, so it was a really important moment. They allowed um, just four people in, it was uh, myself, the sound um, guy, and uh, uh, Magnani, and the interpreter who was helping Nani for the questions, and of course didn't allow us to go inside the prison, they put us in the first little room by the main door, which was a little bit of a nurse, nursery room, so uh, like an infirmary, so there was this yellow <laughs> wall and that said it was really e difficult to work there. È stata molto dura the ti interview was very challenging because these loro people talk about their 30 anni, experience and they've been doing so for 30 years and they have very convincing words so sometimes you feel naked in front of what they're sharing with you. The words that Nani and I shared when we were out Word out, we felt as if we had been undressed because they are really narrow minded. So when the interview ended, Nani got up you saw what happened. I was about to shut off the camera. But it was so important to have what was happening in our film that I just saw Nani with the back of my eyes and Nani just did this gesture. This is a gesture that 
we use to show where the camera needs to be. So when you flip your fingers that way, it means uh, move the camera up because it had been set for an interview where they were sitting down, but they had stood up. So I kept filming and I tilted the camera up and I panned and I pretended I wasn't filming because uh, you know, technically I wasn't supposed to. And the sound guy and myself just exchanged a super quick look and we pretended we were not shooting and we kept rolling, we kept rolling for that um, little section, which ended up being the most important one, one of the most important ones in the entire film. Al tempo stesso, eh, Maura, ci sono anche eh, dei momenti Maura, at the uh, same time, there are also molto, molto lunghi, molto gioviali, come per esempio è quello della, della banda musicale, such as, for example, the one anche with the su questo band. volevi so, fare, fare un commento e quindi direi di guardarla I insieme. I wanted for you to comment on this a little bit, so please let's watch uh, the video together and then you can tell us what happened behind the scenes for um, this final scene. Questa è una storia molto morettiana. Yes, this is a very Moretti-like story. Nanni si attento, which talks sembra about distratto, how ma in realtà Nanni è is, he comes off as very absent-minded, but he's always following Abbiamo everything. Finito di girare, we had finished shooting and we were just walking around in a place which right now is at the center of the Chile Revolution, which is happening right now. It's the Piazza 9th Bridge and we were looking towards Plaza Italia. We had just had ice cream because, you know, Nanni is a, such a glad un angolo della strada dove and, c'era um, questa banda di giovani at a street corner stava. where there was this band of young Chilean people that were playing and he was enchanted I hadn't really understood what was happening so I was just um, walking ahead and I was waiting for them at the next corner so he um, arrived and said you need to find this band for me he actually told us when we were back in Italy so at the time nobody thought of um, getting their contact information so we just started, you know, eh, looking for this eh, band. De, de la calle. Uh, they, eh, these are street bands. Più, trovata, anche and when we identified them, we needed, we, song song that that song song we needed to recognize the song that Nani had liked, which ended up being this one. So it Chile, took a long time to do this research between Italy and Chile. I went back in April. I did some tests with them and I filmed all of the songs they were playing so that we could identify the one that Nani wanted and then the final scene which is set in the Museum of Memory and this was my proposal I um, shot them with Nani being connected remotely so I shot it on my, my own with him um, giving me indications on what he wanted uh, from afar with these kids that we were able to locate I don't even know how. It was such a miracle, but we did find them. So it was a treasure hunt and it was a transnational moment of creativity between Italy and Chile with a Moretti who we all know to be very obsessive. Uh, when, when, you, when, you, you know, he has a, something he's obsessive about, he doesn't let go, but he's always right in doing so. I would like to go back now to what Jaime mentioned earlier, and that is one of the short videos, which is when of the most moving eh, moments in the documentary, cardinale, which refers to the cardinal who literally um, defended 
the eh, victims of dictatorship put himself on the line. And this is followed by a testimony by um, some of the people you interviewed, which creates an interesting tension between um, the believers, the Catholics, and the non believers, the atheists, who end up uh, sharing a moment of solidarity. So I'd like to uh, have your comment in this, in this transversal connection that uh, is created in moments of tension. So as usual, let's watch the short video together. And then, Mara, I'd like to uh, hear your comment, and you can also comment on why uh, you ended up including certain people and you ended up leaving some aside. Io non so contro chi lotta questo governo, contro il popolo del Cile. È una cosa stranissima. Un, un esercito che lotta contro il popolo, contro la sua patria. Per imporre una situazione con la forza. Quello che più ha contato però, quelli che hanno fatto il, il miglior lavoro durante la, la dittatura sono stati è la, la Chiesa Cattolica, noi avevamo un cardinale che era una persona meravigliosa, che era l'unico che fermava i militari quando stavano esagerando, l'unico che si era preoccupato delle persone che sparivano, delle persone che torturavano e le chiese erano diventate il rifugio di tutti quelli che non avevano altre possibilità. Questo cardinale è un po' stato dimenticato e, e, e Voitila l'ha fatto fuori appena ha compiuto 75 anni ma penso che sia stato la personalità più importante della resistenza cilena in quei tempi lì i giovani volevano farsi sacerdoti perché era talmente come posso dire era talmente grande la statura morale di questo prete perché ti sei commosso? come mai ti sei commosso pensando a questo cardinale? perché era come devono essere i cardinali. Io non sono cattolico, sono completamente ateo, non c'entro niente con questo qui. Però quando una persona merita il rispetto, bisogna darglielo. Maura, raccontaci. Beh, eh, ovviamente questo, questo pezzo di repertorio è venuto dopo l'intervista a Rodrigo, che è stato uno dei primi che è stato a Rodrigo, che è uno dei primi che è stato a Roma, che è cileno, che è venuto perché è stato a Emilia Romagna, dove appunto a Fiorentina non abbiamo abitato. C'è una grande cileno comunità e al final del film andiamo a celebrare le interviste agli altri cileni. Nanni è rimasto molto colpito dalle interviste con tutti gli altri cileni. Other Chileans, and Nani was very impressed by the reaction of this man, and also by the simplicity of Rodrigo. He says, I'm an atheist, I am not a Catholic at all, but if you look at him, he comes off as a priest, uh, he shows up with sandals on foot, he didn't want to uh, get a taxi. He is a very, very special e, person. E Nani è rimasto molto colpito Nani da, da le emozioni di tutti quanti. Cioè, gran parte dei cileni che erano in Italia si sono emozionati alle domande. Um, the e quindi diceva, ma è normale? Or in Italy, they were interviewed, were moved, and uh, the question was, is, is it normal? Yes, it is, because we have not talked. Adesso about what happened enough. Finally, we're doing that. It's something that still burns inside people. 
Ed è um, sicuramente um, anche un momento importante Definitely che ritorna con lui perché lo intervistate e diciamo su vari argomenti. E, 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 vorrei soffermarmi brevemente perché like so che, che hai anche l'esigenza poi di annunciare Maura sull'ambasciata ecco perché per me questo, questo documentario è, me, è soprattutto questo momento di diplomazia e questo momento legato ad un luogo che forse più istituzionale di così eh, possiamo immaginarlo un luogo più istituzionale e che però diventa estremamente corroso Vedendo eh, questo eh, documentario, Lydia, we can move to the slide that refers to the Italian Lydia, embassy. Can move to the slide that um, refers mi è venuto in mente il concetto di Foucault, so di uh, Foucault's concept di cioè un luogo che contiene tutti i luoghi, in un certo senso, no? come un microcosmo della società. So speak, like Questa ambasciata diventa rifugio, è so una sorta di palcoscenico delle cose umane, no? penso che abbiamo un stage of human di, things. di tutto, no? si cucina, eh, si, si innamora, ci si bisticcia, ci sono anche momenti drammatici, come il ritrovamento del corpo e dei lumi, e quindi è anche un luogo di ansia, di ansia, Paura. Io vorrei fear, eh, eh, far vedere well. questa clip che è un pochino like più lunga, però penso sia importante video, which is a little longer, but I think it's important to pay a tribute to Italian diplomacy in this um, um, situation under uh, these circumstances because they actually acted with a sense of humanity and with courage which today we wish we had compared to some more issues. Um, uh, to the next uh, clip. Thank you. A un certo punto c'era una tale corsa alle ambasciate da parte di questi cileni che erano, che erano impazziti dal terrore eh, e, e, e allora saltavano il muro, quindi non, non chiedevano neanche, non entravano in maniera normale. Lì il muro dell'ambasciata è molto basso, adesso l'hanno aumentato, l'hanno gli hanno dato un metro di più, adesso sono tre metri, ma a quei tempi è, era basso, era un paio di metri e qualcuno aveva tolto dei mattoni qui e lì in modo da fare una specie di scaletta e questi arrivavano boom, e saltavano dentro. E, e qui è venuto il mio eh, caso di coscienza, quando io ho cominciato a vedere questi ingressi incontrollati, io mi sono detto che faccio? Eh, io avevo chiesto a, al mio ministero di darmi istruzioni su quello che dovevo fare, naturalmente si sono ben guardati dal farlo e allora io ho deciso di, di tenerli tutti, eh, di, di non mandare via nessuno. Con alcune ambasciate abbiamo lavorato, proprio, abbiamo collaborato molto, gli svedesi, gli svedesi mm. hanno... molte ambasciate hanno preso rifugiati, però hanno, hanno smesso molto prima. Noi abbiamo continuato più degli altri. Beh, questo salone era, era una stanza da letto, non unica, non per una persona ovviamente, ma per 50. Eravamo in 50 qua e tutte le sere. Eravamo in tanti, e lo spazio era grande, un isolato completo. Io mi sono trovato bene, poi c'erano tutti i compagni, molti di loro più vecchi di me, quindi è stata un'occasione per discutere, parlare, accumulare esperienza. C'era una stanza grande, la chiamavamo La Legua, che è un quartiere popolare di Santiago e avevamo dei materassi per terra, eravamo due per materasso. Io con l'altro compagno che dormiva con me eravamo i vicini, ecco, lui si buttava di là, io di qua... Però io avevo la fortuna di avere vent'anni, quindi a quell'età lì tutte queste cose qui sono, non dico che sono divertenti perché qualche pensiero c'era, però no, non sono cose che pesano più di tanto, io avrei dormito per terra senza nessuna difficoltà. Molte persone in uno spazio molto piccolo, allora era molto divertente perché c'erano tre, tre piani e anche un sotterraneo. Nel sotterraneo c'erano alcune coppie e con i bambini anche, poi nelle, nella parte che dava verso la piscina eh, c'erano solo gli uomini eh, non sposati, come si dice, nuveli? Ecco. Celibi. Celibi.
solo gli uomini celibi. E poi eh, c'eravamo le copie nell'altro piano e nell'ultimo piano le ragazze nubili. <ride> C'era un, cor- un, co- un baio <ride> Si correva su e giù tutta la notte. <ride> non c'era un posto per me per dormire e ho trovato la vasca da bagno dell'ambasciatrice. Lo facciamo in spagnolo. In spagnolo un momento. Let's move on to Spanish. Uh, just for a second. Because the next a lot of uh, students who are listening to us and it would be uh, fun to speak Spanish as well. Para comentar lo que pasó ahí en ese momento histórico. Pero también Jaime nos puede contar brevemente lo que significa hoy esa embajada. Si hay una herencia, digamos, de la historia. Ahora. Maura. Ah, ¿voy yo? Sí, sí, sí. O va Jaime. Maura, Maura. Maybe Jaime should comment. No, Maura, do so. No, no. ¿Qué decir? What can I say? The documentary says it all. The importance of the two diplomats who were there at that time, who made decisions on their own because the government didn't really give them much support. Y todo lo que ha pasado adentro, and ese de microcosmos del right macrocosmos, uh, o sea, esto, lo que estaba pasando en Chile se, se pasó a, adentro de Chile la misma embajada. Entonces, happened. Uh, replicated inside the embassy, so the fights between the political parties, the fights between men and women, um, you know, some, feeling somebody else's wife and the kids um, playing. Everything that was happening in the country was happening inside as well. So how did you feel going inside there? It's beautiful to go inside that historic moment. The gentleman that says we were sleeping there is one of my parents' friends. Ever since I was little, I knew him. And to see him there in that place that his stories are setting was a deeply moving moment. Jaime, is there a legacy for the story now? And what happens because then I have another question for Maura. Hay una herencia yes, there is a political legacy, eh, que es muy which is very Esa important. This legacy is Chile connected to how you start to rebuild Chile after what happened. And inside the embassy, and inside other embassies, but mostly the um, Italian embassy, because it had a lot of uh, weight. People started talking, talking about the day after, and that is fundamental for the building of the transition to democracy. Without this day after, the people started to dream about in the darkest moment of dictatorship, one could not uh, get to the agreement that uh, you started there. As we were saying, the fights between the parties started there and the reconciliation started there as well. And this is essential for the country. Thank you very much. We are running late, but I think that it is so interesting what we're talking about. And I'd like to finish off with a short video that is about the present time. It is a reference to uh, today's um, refugees, y saber de Maura, and I'd like como, to know from Maura si, uh, how that happened, if Moretti was si interested or there uh, was some lo, development lo agarró, in the conversation uh, and then he held on to it. Película, so Center, this is very interesting because when I saw this film in the Lincoln Center, decir, I was no sitting next to a person who wasn't recognizing that Nani Moretti and couldn't understand why Nani Moretti was doing that kind of documentary. So the historic question is also about the legacy and uh, I thought it was very evident in the contemporary scenario. But was this the plan in the beginning or did that happen afterwards? It's very, very short. It's like 40 seconds. Il flusso degli asilati piano piano si è spostato in persone che scappavano scappavano come scappano oggi dall'Africa eh, da, dalla fame dice vabbè andiamo a vedere che succede eh, se proviamo ad andare in Europa e, e uscire da qua il ministero degli esteri aveva 
si era preoccupato, non voleva uh, concedere il visto eh, per paura che, ne arrivasse, che diventassero, o, come dire, quello che oggi si dice pull factor. Si dice che non bisogna salvare la gente che muore nel Mediterraneo perché più ne salvi e più ne arrivano. Questa è la logica un po' cinica, veramente, no? Ora. Bueno, como te contaba, cuando nos conocimos, saying, eh, ha cambiado met, mucho desde el comienzo. Things have changed a lot. Las preguntas um, de Nani the documentary changed from the beginning to the end because in the beginning, la vuelta a Chile, um, the todos los questions that Nani was asking were about when these people were going y, back to Chile. So it was a lot longer. Italia, But then when we came to Italy and then there was a new government, the Salvini government in Italy, which was starting to be um, against immigration, natural, el, el so it was really uh, natural to la, cut la, el, el cuento de los the y storytelling Italia, by the Chilean and leave them in Italy cuan, eh, and then Italia, talk about what happened when they arrived in Italy and hora, how Italy was welcoming at the time and how they're not doing it now. Or some do, but a lot less than at that time. So that's how this part evolved. So the great success of this documentary in Italy was due to that because we are going through a very important historic moment. And uh, now in this film, we see how different Italy was. It was another country. So the documentary is not a thesis based documentary. That's not the issue. No, but se con el at the end, de una, de una it creates a connection with the present in a very strong way. Um, and I read that Moretti um, um, talked about la, this la with um, de young people de Chile, and um, de lo, de los años 70, the experience um, of these refugees ahora, from no, Chile in the 70s, speaking to them um, in a no very strong way. Para We don't have time la, to show the story of the refugees that que se mudaron a Italia, unos pensando que en cualquier momento se podían ir, ¿verdad? Siempre con la maleta ahí bajo del trama, pero pasaron años, pasaron años y ahí están y era un país que sí los aceptó, ¿no? Con trabajo, con espíritu solidal, se veían como héroes, ¿no? Y ahora And now, as Mara was saying, uh, it's a very different story. Of course, there are a lot of exceptions, but generally speaking, the attitude has changed. And therefore, um, even more Moretti for what you did. I guess I'm going to speak in English now, though we're very pleased that Maura was able to represent Nani Moretti tonight with wonderful stories and, uh, and, uh, and anecdotes. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Jaime for uh, uh, taking us uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to Chile and to Chile of today with so much having to do with, uh, with the past, obviously. Um, I am very pleased at this point to, to thank uh, everybody else uh, among the, the guests, uh, uh, the speakers, uh, those who have made this possible, uh, our audience from, uh, from around the world. Please uh, write to us uh, if you want. We'll be able to entertain your questions uh, by, uh, by email. And uh, uh, grazie, gracias, uh, uh, thank you, and uh, uh, till the next one.